Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the last day and a half of Project Challenge. Uh, my name is Sarah Coleman, and I'm going to talk to you over the next 40 minutes or so about developing project leadership. So this, a lot of the, the materials being taken from a book which has just been published uh, late last year by myself and co-author Donnie McNichol, who sends his apologies, is not able to be with us today. Um, and we're going to cover a number of things. We're going to cover why leadership for project management at all. Uh, that's one of the big questions I often get asked. But I also get asked, what is the difference? What, it, what makes the difference for project leaders as opposed to project managers. We'll look at that too. There's a little bit here about organizational culture and the impact it actually has and what kind of leadership styles that you might actually choose to take on while you're leading projects. And a couple of models for you as well to take away and think about, about uh, how you might use them, uh, but also what they might mean in the context that you're working and the projects that you're working with at the moment. So one of the things that we talk about quite a bit is a VUCA world. I don't know if any of you have actually come across this term at all. Are you familiar with the word VUCA? My understanding is it was originally a, a military term, and it was one that they, they looked at and they used when they went into something like Afghanistan. They made all their plans up front. They thought they knew what they were doing, but once they got on the ground, they knew it was going to be quite substantially different to what they had anticipated. So VACA actually stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and all of those things that we find in especially major and complex projects as well. You can plan, but you know from day one there are things that are going to hit you that you haven't quite anticipated. And businesses and organizations also increasingly are working uh, in what we call the VACA world. The context that they're working in is changing all the time. We've seen a lot around climate change and the environment over the last few years. We've seen a lot about the economic situation. Um, and now we're seeing, especially with Brussels in the last couple of days, what's happening in the political world as well. So organizations and businesses are always working against a, a constantly changing backdrop. And that actually impacts a lot of what we do as organizations and businesses, and therefore what projects, program, portfolio managers do, change managers do as well. We also see that organizations actually use projects now and programs, portfolios of way, ways of delivering things, not just for external clients, not, not talking about just the traditional bits around heavy engineering construction, but all kinds of different uh, aspects for clients, both internally within the organization and externally. And what we're finding is that certainly the traditional views of project management, which are around the planning and control tools, is shifting. This focus is shifting a bit. And it's actually moving towards understanding that the human aspects of projects are just as important because it's the people who deliver projects. So this is not about an either or. It's really about a rebalancing of the skill sets that you need when you're actually managing, delivering, leading projects too. Because we understand that leadership doesn't just reside with people who hold the title of leaders. In fact, we also know that people who hold the title of leaders don't necessarily exhibit good leadership skills. And in order to, to do what we need to do and take people with us, we need the capabilities, some of the capabilities of those leadership skills. And we know as project managers, and certainly this is where I came up from, that actually to be really efficient, really capable, we need a skill set that incorporates a huge diverse range of things, and leadership is one of those skill sets as well. So let's have a quick look at leading and managing. This is leading and managing 101. So a very quick aspect around what is the difference between managing, what is the difference between leading. And one of the very easy uh, definitions I found is Stephen Covey. Does anybody familiar with Stephen Covey? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Yeah, okay. Um, absolutely uh, golden, that book. 
Uh, if you don't know it, please have a look at it, because actually it's very, very useful. And what he talks about two aspects. One is management is the efficiency in climbing the ladder, whereas leadership actually tells you where this ladder should be situated in the first place. And it very much echoes Shell's idea in the 1980s around this aspect of what they called helicopter views. And what they said was, in those days, that they could spot potential future leaders within their organizations by people who could exhibit two things. One was being able to get into the detail, but the other was to actually go at the levels of abstraction and look at the big picture, the wider picture. What is the context for what you're trying to achieve here as well? So I think that this works pretty well with what I'm going to be talking about for the next session. So the book looks like this. I do have, if you're interested, I do have um, a discount of 35% from Routledge. Um, and it's divided into four parts. And we're going to be looking at a bit about part one, which is around project leadership and the project leader. A little bit about part three, which are, looks at three key competencies for project leadership. And also a little bit about part four, which is about how you, as an individual, can actually develop your leadership competencies, but at the same time, what your organization should be doing to actually help you develop those competencies too, and what you can expect. So, first of three competencies for a project leader. These are the things that matter. These are the differences that make the difference. And a lot of those skill sets and capabilities are around three areas. It's around what we call business acumen. How commercially minded are you? How do you, much do you understand what's going on? Then there's the interpersonal skills. How do you go out and find the people who can support you? How do you know who you need to build those very strong, robust relationships with? And there's also what I call organizational intelligence, understanding how your organization works, where the influencers are, where the power groups, where the power play actually is as well. Because it's not just about hierarchy, it's also about spheres of influence and who actually holds the strings and holds the support that perhaps you need to draw on to make your project success. So the first competency here that really does make the difference is vision and big picture. We talked about shell and moving up and down the levels of abstraction. But this really un tries to understand what is it that you're doing and how does it fit in with organizational strategy? How do you align what you're doing with what your organization is trying to achieve? Why does it matter what you're doing at all? And there are a number of areas here. Can you put together a project vision that actually aligns with your organization vision? Can you communicate this? Can you market it in a meaningful way? Because the big picture gives you the pestle view. It gives you the context, the political, the social, the economic, the technological, what is actually going on in this big world that your project actually matters. And also understanding success factors too, not just the obvious ones, because a lot of organizations are still running with financial measures as measures of success. But we're talking about a, more of a, a balanced scorecard approach and beyond too. What is it that actually matters? What is success when they see it? So crucial questions for projects are really around this. Why does it make a difference to the organization at all? Who do I need to get involved in this and gain their support, their un enduring support for the whole of the project? What are we going to have to do in order to do this? What kind of skills and capabilities do we need that we've got in the organization or need to buy in from outside? What do we actually need as skill sets? And what is it going to do for us? Where is the value in what we're actually trying to achieve here? And then finally, how are we going to learn from it and actually go through this continual double loop learning? How are we going to make a difference and make sure that we stay on top of our game? Because what we're really looking for in any of this is about competitive advantage in the market. So second key competency 
is around building key relationships. Who here recognizes or thinks that they're actually strong, very strong in building good, solid relationships with stakeholders and their own team? With their project sponsor, with their senior management teams, when they're reporting, when they're explaining what they're doing? Some hands, thank you very much. For the rest of you, is this an option for you? Is this something you should be doing, you recognize you should be doing or might be doing? Would you gain some value from it? So here it's about the usual thing about stakeholder identification engagement, but it works stronger than that. It's actually finding the people who actually matter to what you're doing. That might be your client. It's certainly a project team, but it's going to be your governance team as well, your senior management. You've all got managers, line managers. Who manages their manager? Who actually thinks about line managing their manager? Yeah? OK. So some, some hands up, some not. If you were to manage your manager, what would you be doing for them? Because your job is not just to bring this project in successfully, but it's also to make your manager look good. So how do you know how you're going to make your manager look good? These are key relationships that you need to think about. And everything within organizations is about prioritization of resources, whether it's people or capital equipment, knowledge or skills. How are you using this? How do you see this playing out in the organization? And organizations make decisions based on their priorities for the business. So how, are you, how is your project actually working? How does it align to what they're trying to do in their priorities? It's also about understanding your own influence within the organization and your own power base and how you can actually increase that and make it work for you too. Anybody actually do this? Is politics a dirty word for you? Or is it something you recognize and prefer not, not to get involved with? No? OK. So do you know people who are political sharks in organizations? People who actually like to play the games and like to manipulate and like to put the cat amongst the pigeons? And you probably know on the other end of the scale, the people who really don't want to get involved at all. They'd really rather not. They just want to get on with the job, do a good job, get their promotion, and be recognized for what they do and how they do it. And then there's the people in the middle who are called the political, the political sensibles. They know that politics happens in organizations. They know it. But actually, they work to their advantage of themselves, their teams, and their projects in a good way, not in a manipulative, Machiavellian way. So organizational intelligence and politics and understanding politics and organizations is actually quite a key role for any project manager who's moving across functions and up and down levels and hierarchies within the organization. Third area is communication and engagement. There you are. There's your huge, huge group of stakeholders. So how are you going to work with them? How are you going to communicate with them? Is it one size fits all? You're just going to swamp them with information, so hopefully they won't ask too many questions. What are you actually going to do? Because they will help you build your credibility and support for what you're trying to do. Perhaps you do have communication plan, but you do it when you've, you've got time to do it at the end of the week and not before. Um, do you invite feedback for what you're doing, or do you just go ahead and do it anyway? And this idea about branding and marketing for projects is quite new, but we take it from actual mainstream marketing stuff, even about, think about advertising a product in a magazine or on television. How do you do that, and how do you make it work for you? So these three areas are quite critical. Business acumen, big picture, and vision. Um, organizational intelligence and also communication. There are three things that do make a difference for project leaders. And you're all project leaders in your way because you're all managing teams. You need leadership competencies within that. But also, you're actually 
talking to the wider world. You're talking to your wider network about what you're doing, and you're trying to build that support and those relationships for it. Because if you're building the support, you're building the commitment. One of the models we actually use in the book is what we call the eight lookings. And the, uh, one of the areas that we look at here, well, in fact, a number of them, we talk about wiring into stakeholders. And this very much links, it, links up with what we were talking about, communication and the wider picture here. So looking upwards, managing your manager up to the executive board, in this case, the governance. Um, looking outwards to your client. You're all doing that? Some nods. Achieving the vision. So this is about where it aligns to organizational strategy, but also have you got a project vision yourself as well, that you're explaining to people why it's important that this project actually goes ahead and why you still need this commitment around resources. Because as you know, and I know, resources often go walkabout into different projects and into different areas. So again, are you thinking about achieving the vision? Then there's keeping on the ball, which is all, always about performance, looking to the future, looking at the past. What's actually happened for your project in the, over the last couple of months, and what's actually the next steps, and what are you looking at in terms of earned value going to the future? And then finally, focusing on results. What about your own performance? What about your team's performance, as much as the project performance as well? So if I were to ask you where currently, with your current project, your focus is on those, I say, four, four pairs, hands up those whose focus at the moment is predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly, on wiring into stakeholders. OK, thank you. Achieving the vision. Oh, a lot less, a lot less. Keeping on the ball. So this is about performance, looking at the past, looking at the future. Some, again, some hands up. And what about focusing on results? Your performance, your team's performance, where is that? OK. So a smattering of hands each time. So I'm going to ask the next question now, which is, if that's where you are now, where do you think you should be? Where actually should you be on this? Because as you go through the life cycle of a project, your attention and your focus is going to be different. You're going to be looking at different things. Your mind is going to be, not, not exclusively, but predominantly, on a specific aspect of those eight lookings there. So if your focus, you know where your focus is at the moment, is that the right focus? Should it be somewhere else? And probably it'll shift again. So often it depends what kind of project you're on, what kind of role you have within the project, but also where through that life cycle you are with that project as well. So there are a lot of dimensions to this. The last model that I want to introduce you to for this is around project culture. And this is often about what the organization is like. Because especially in major projects that we see, especially with government, is that it's quite important to be able to match the kind of organization that you have with the kind of leadership skills that you have. Trying to bring in somebody who will be a deliberate disruptor to an organization, especially when you've got a major project that you're trying to achieve can be quite a risky business. So we do also look at what kind of culture you've got for that as well. And we've looked at two particular dimensions here. We've looked at centralization for, a, for a, um, an organization. And by that, I mean how much delegated power is there throughout the organization. Is it all centralized and focused in one particular area? Or actually, is it disseminated down maybe to different geographies, maybe to different um, offices, maybe to different sites, to different functions, to different levels within the organization as well? And then across the bottom, we've got collaboration. And really what we're talking about here is, well, 
how much does this organization actually talk to each other? How familiar is the client with what you're trying to do? So with collaboration, it's all about do you actually spend the time talking to one another or are you stuck in silos and very, very focused in what you're doing? Do you share knowledge and information right across the team, across your functions? Do you have cross-functional working in its, in its best sense at all? And out of those two axes, obviously there are four quadrants. Two by two matrices are great tools to use for, for, to get conversations going. So what we have here is where collaboration is very low and centralization in the organization is also very low, what we're talking about is we have a lot of delegated authority. Um, and, but also we have very low sharing of information and collaboration within the organization as well. Anybody recognize this as a culture for their organization? Where centralization in the organization is high, so you've got very defined structures, very defined hierarchies, especially around decision making, for example, um, but again, collaboration is low, we've got what we call process rules. And what that means is that everything is done according to a set of rules um, and a set of policies, and you're very much following the rules around this as well. Relationship rules, where you've got a high degree of collaboration and people actually do talk to each other and share information, share ideas, share the community and get a community. Maybe you've got um, communities of practice within your organization. These are great ways to actually talk about what's happening and being able to learn from what's going on. Um, but again, centralization is quite low. So you've still got delegated authority. Has to be, any decision has to actually be up the chain. You have to throw it up for a final decision on that. You don't get much say in that yourself. And then finally, high centralization, high collaboration, we've got what we call community rules. And that means we actually have a defined structure, but we've got a lot of knowledge sharing and a lot of conversations, good conversations, robust conversations going on right around the organization as well. So if I were to ask you which quadrant your organization actually resides in at the moment, what would you be saying? Quick conversation with your next door neighbor for a minute about where you would see or how you would see your organization being on that. I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you which organization you actually work for, but I do at the end of this have a conversation and let's talk about where your organization resides in those four, within those four quadrants. You've got a minute. Find a partner, find somebody you've never talked to and actually have a conversation. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, so hands up for your organization. Let's take it from the top left hand side. Anybody recognize their organizational culture as process rules? Okay, so quite a number of, of hands going up. How about top right, community rules? Where's your organization? A couple of hands, thank you. Bottom left hand, individual rules. Okay, a few more hands, thank you. And finally, bottom right, relationship rules. Again, a couple of, of hands going up. Now thinking, bearing in mind what you've just admitted to and the organization, my question to you is this, are you working for the right organization? <laughs> Be because you have your own preferences for how you work and the kind of environments in which you're strongest and you let your strengths out, and we all like to work to our strengths. So the kind of organization that you're saying your organization is, is this relevant? Is this recognizable for you? It's an important question, especially with the career 
and the, the years that we still have left in our careers too. So the next question is, okay, so what kind of a project leader works best in these different types of organizations? And I'm having a piece of paper waved at me at the back, so I'm gonna do maybe one or two of these. So for example, if we were to, for those of you who said community rules, what best, what type of project leader works best for that? We're talking about somebody who likes to work with established processes and structures, but also has a lot of flexibility and adaptability in their own personal way of working. And also is quite organizationally intelligent. Remember I talked about organizational intelligence, understanding where their power plays, where the dynamics are, where the spheres of influence are, where you can go to to build your support. So each one of these types of cult organizational culture has a particular type of project leader who works best in that type of environment. So think again about whether the, the organization culture you have actually works best for you. I'm going to finish on a cu last couple of things. Um, part four of the book talks about how to develop project leadership capability. Um, and the best organizations have in place huge range of structures to support development around these capabilities. Um, some of them are actually things like talent programs, which you're probably quite familiar with because they're, they're fairly well done. Um, coaching and mentoring seems to be a favorite at the moment. So these are all kinds of areas that you can work on that aren't just around formal, um, formal training, going off on your three-day, five-day programs, have a tick in the box, do your exam, and you've got your certificate at the end. These are things about behavioral changes and how you actually make it stick with you as well. But even with the best organizations who have this kind of support mechanism for you, how do you take control of it and actually make it work for you? Because you yourselves, when you're going from managing to leading, it is a different mindset. It's a different set of focus. It's a different way of working. So how do you leave behind the familiar and start to embrace the new, which is really what this is all about? Well, first of all, it's about values. You do what matters to you. You do what matters to you personally. You also need some time and space to actually take these things in. Um, and also, you need to accept that actually you're going to lose some things or leave some things behind and move forward onto something different. So, some of the things that you're doing currently, you'll keep. Some of them you'll delegate to somebody else. Now often we don't necessarily, especially with um, numbers of people leaving organizations, we don't always have that, that luxury. Um, so a lot of things often get just dropped off the end because you cannot do two jobs. You ab absolutely physically cannot do so. And you're trying to pick up new skills and you're trying to enhance to a certain extent some of your existing skills as well. So you're trying to make this your focus of attention here. What you need to do is going to be different. You are going to drop some, delegate some, you're going to pick up some new skills. So you need to make time for it. And you need to value what you're doing in moving forward as well. I know that there are time for some questions now. So I'm going to leave it there and to say that I can, um, if you're interested, I will give you a form for, book, for the book. Um, but thank you very much. Questions, please. Any questions on any of the tools that you've, you've seen there? Thank you. Um, probably a standard question, but um, do you think anyone can learn leadership? Do I think anybody can learn leadership? Um, John Adair asked the question a long time ago, are leaders born or made? And I, my, um, 
my response to that is sometimes uh, we have leadership thrust upon us. Um, and certainly my experience is coming up through a very technical project management route and being then put in charge of a, a group of people, which is great on the management stakes, but once you start to move up and you start to manage multinational, multi-million pound contracts, you need to hone your skills a bit more. And I think that's the diff when you actually make that step. The question, can you do it? The answer, I would say, is yes. But some of us do it better than others. There are lots of people out there who do leadership a lot better than I ever did in my career and do now. Um, but I admire them. And they're role models as well. And you can learn an awful lot from people in your own organizations that you look at and think, they do that p p particularly well. I'm going to try and use that myself. So I think the standard answer is yes. What is your own experience? Um, I, uh, I, I think I sort of <laughs> agree with what you're saying. I think there, there, are, there are people who are almost born leaders and take to it naturally. And there are people that have to work at it. Yes. Uh, like me included, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> Anybody else? Please. Um, if, if you have um, negative stakeholders or negative team members, yes. um, how, how do you handle those as, as, a, as a manager and, and, and a leader? Okay. Um, I'm going to throw this open to you. <laughs> What is the best thing that you've seen to turn people around who are a little bit um, negative, perhaps subtle sabotage, perhaps just hanging back, not going in, uh, perhaps deliberately, um, uh, deliberately challenging what has been agreed or the way forward? One of the things that I've noticed in my career um, is it takes a lot of different personalities to make a team and a lot of different skill sets to make a team as well. Um, anybody know the psychometric tool, testing tools? There are loads of them out there, but one of the particular ones is Belbin. Anybody recognize Belbin? Okay, so lots of hands, you all know Belbin. Um, I come out as a strong shaper. My secondary preference is a completer finisher, which I understand is really odd. What that actually means is, it has taken me a long time to, le to learn to love monitor evaluators. And monitor evaluators are often the people who come up and say, yes, but we haven't thought about this, or I don't think that will work because. And it's about their, their points of view are very valid. The more diverse um, group that you have, the more perspectives you're going to, to encounter, different perspectives, different ways of doing things, different expectations, different experiences. It depends where this negativity is actually coming from. Whether it's actually, I can't actually do what you're asking me to do, and I don't want to tell you because I'm really frightened, or I don't think it'll work because there's a big flaw in this plan and you really need to listen to me, um, or I can't actually be bothered to do this talk. So it depends where this actually comes from as to how you might then go on and work with it or work around it. If all else fails, and I have known people like this, um, some people that I do know have actually gone to management and said, this is not working, you need to switch this person out. They obviously are not well um, established in what they do. They don't have the skill sets that I particularly need here. Um, and actually, they don't fit well. If you look at the organizational cultural thing, and every project team has a, a culture of its own, it, they're not w working well within the culture. I need to swap them out. Depends where this negativity actually comes from. Yeah? Hi. Hi. Sorry, I wasn't too sure if you were going to finish the presentation right there and then. No, no, um, no. I guess uh, leadership has evolved over the last few years, which is you know business evolution, etc. And I think teams have probably evolved as well in terms of the old command and control structure. People are less probably deferential now okay. uh, and actually more sort of democratic. How do you think it's going to evolve, say, in five years' time from where we are today? That's a very nice question. Um, 
it's been interesting to, to see how leadership has evolved. A lot of the, the original thoughts about leadership came from military. Um, in the 1980s, you had this idea about the lone maverick leader. And it was all of the command and control, it was very directional, you all do this. Um, I don't want to know what you, you think, but this is what I'm telling you to do. This is what I expect you to do. Um, and the hierarchy that you find in organization also validates a lot of the roles, responsibilities, and seniorities. So if I'm more senior than you, I can tell you what to do. But I think in the last, um, I would say 10 years, 15 years, what we see is a big shift. And the shift is more towards leadership as a social thing rather than a process thing. So you've got a lot now about the authentic leader, the, the leader is servant idea, the incomplete leader. Has anybody ever come across that? Amanda Ancona, I think it is. Incomplete leader who, who actually says, I know I don't know everything. I cannot hope to know everything that there needs to be about this, so that's why I get a team of very, very competent, clever people around me to help me plug the gaps that I actually don't have. And I think perhaps that going forward, um, especially with something like project leadership, where they're not heading a business, they're heading a project within an organization, it's probably more about the social uh, relationship building things, the, the supporting the people and setting the environment to do what they need to do best. So it's support is a support mechanism, rather uh, as well as this is where we're going and this is how we're going to do it, guys. Um, but what we're seeing is a lot more diverse teams as well. So it's about the inclusivity of all of that too. So there are a lot of different dimensions on this, but I, I personally think that a lot of it is going to move a lot more towards the more social aspects, if, you, if that makes sense. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Um, probably been covered slightly with the last question, I think, but how do you handle as a project leader responsibility without authority? Oh, that's where the organisation intelligence definitely comes in. Influencing without authority is a, is a big question. Um, because, exactly as you say, uh, project leaders, project managers typically don't have... Um, they, they move around the hierarchy, they move around the organization, they move around functions all the time. They don't necessarily have behind them um, the role, the authority to do what they need to do. Uh, and the easiest way of doing it is understanding where your influence lies, how you can build your influence, um, where your power base is in the organization that you can actually leverage. We all know people in organizations that are leaders in their own right. They're not at the top. They're not um, nominated as leaders, but they are people who people go to to listen to, to talk about issues or things that are happening in the organization. And they genuinely want to know what these people think. And those people are often the influencers, the big influencers in organizations. Um, they might not have the seniority, they might not have the salary, but they do have the nous. And a lot of the skills is in the relationship building and an understanding how those, that influence actually works. There's a whole range of discussion about how you can increase influence. Very happy to talk to you about it because this is one area which um, I've thought about, worked with a lot, um, and I talk about quite a bit as well. But I think that's, um, yes, influencing without authority is a big part. Quite right, thank you. Last question, yeah? Any last questions? Um, what are the, uh, the best ways for line managers to switch the hat between their business as usual, line management responsibilities, and their project leadership responsibilities? Um, okay. How would you... Okay, let me ask this a different way. Why would your capabilities that you need for project leadership be any different from your leadership capabilities for business as usual? I would say in my own very personal situation um, in, in our organization, we're an information management company, and the, the, uh, the water's very murky 
people they're, they're very stuck in the in the authoritarian way of we've got to just get the regular business going day to day and all of a sudden a project comes along and they pick it up in the same way and they don't really put in a good project structure they don't put in the project the standard processes no? <laughs> okay um, from that I would uh, recognize an organization that understands the concept of projects but doesn't quite understand the concept of how to do projects well so um, the conversation would probably be at the top at the the top tier it would be a conversation around do you understand the skill sets that might be different from business as usual and if you're asking a single person to flip flop between these two roles do they actually understand enough about the two roles to be able to make that difference um, and approach it in different ways now um, what I'm going to say now prob probably sounds as if it contradicts that a little bit because I, I definitely believe that good managers and good leaders have this have similar skill sets to business as usual as they do to projects you're still looking at budgets, you're still looking at alignment, you're still looking at strategy, relationships, team building, high performing teams. You're still looking at all of those things but in a slightly different context. And trying to flip flop between two of them is a big ask for any organization with a single person. So probably the way I'd be approaching it is not at that tier, it would actually be at the manager, at the managers, the senior management tier. How are you doing on time? Nick, I've probably got one more. One more question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry to jump in, but um, I work with um, a complex uh, set of stakeholders, and if I can uh, share my opinion and views Please. to the gentleman who just asked uh, the question. Uh, in my experience, and I would agree with you, that uh, it, the commitment has to come from the senior management. That is the top priority. And then getting your priorities right, and then working on the capacity, whether the capacity is there or not. And then identifying the right and correct uh, roles and responsibilities yes. within that project team or environment. I think that is the only way it can work. But it doesn't work all the times, unfortunately. I think there are, I would add to that as well, that I think that there are um, ways in which people are um, remunerated also possibly has something to do with this too. If your, your appraisal targets, if your bonus, end of year bonus, whatever, is very firmly fixed on business as usual, you'll make business as usual your priority. If, you're, if it's all about these strategic projects in-house, then you'll be concentrating on strategic projects in-house because we all know that, that targets and measurements and goals drive behaviors. So it will help inform your priorities. But the one thing, um, when I step into interim roles, which I do quite a lot, the big thing for me is, is thinking two things. Number one is keep the business going at all costs because that's what's bringing the money in and that's what's making it survive from day to day. So the priority is actually for me in some of the roles that I'm doing is about keeping the business going. On top of that I'm trying to put layers of change projects in as well at the same time often using the same people so exactly those kind of problems um, and trying to get people's mindsets about both at the same time it's not an easy thing to do, but a lot of the discussions are further up the, the chain. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. If you would like some, um, uh, if you would like a, a discount code to buy the book, please come and see me. I've got some, um, I've got some uh, pamphlets here. I'd be very happy to, to let you have them so that you can do that. But thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.